morning, everyone. It's Wednesday, June 17th, uh, just after 10. This is a meeting of Senate Natural Resources and Energy. Um, and we are going to be uh, uh, revisiting our amendment from yesterday because although we had finished their, our work, the uh, Economic Development Committee had not yet processed you know, the changes we were recommending on sections of theirs that, that we review. So with that, um, I met last evening actually with Senator Sorotkin to go through changes and try to find a, you know, a consensus position. I think we've achieved that, but I leave it to individual, because we're all offering this as individual senators, I wanna make sure we go through it and let anyone who's currently on the amendment decide, well, it's no longer for me or they're fine with it or, and our parent, if you looked at it and said, oh, I, I like it better than I thought, you could get on still. So any, any way, uh, I just wanna make sure we slow down enough to, for everyone to see it. Um, my understanding is that we may not be offering this amendment till the end of the week in order to provide more time for more colleagues to look at it. Um, but I'm not sure if that schedule has been set at any rate, I wanted us on our side to, to be all ready as a committee and understand what was there. So with that preamble, I'd like to turn to Ms. Tchaikovsky once again. Um, and if you could uh, help the committee by walking through the revisions to the amendment uh, as a result of the conversation with economic development, please. Sure. I conveniently already have the documents open, I believe. Nice. <laughs> so, good morning. Uh, I sent uh, Jude this morning draft 7.1 of the amendment as well as a summary document of the amendment. And it is on your website. Okay, thank you. So, uh, draft 7.1 uh, does not have any new language in it. However, language was deleted from yesterday. So the amendment is slightly restructured. Yes. The uh, first tiny, tiny caveat, um, the number of co-sponsors is changing. So this says Senators Bray, Campion, and McDonald, but I have some names to add to the list. So that will change slightly. But the, the primary change to this bill is that the first instance of amendment is now different. Uh, your amendment yesterday, the, the first instance of amendment was striking section 2B. Uh, that is no longer in this amendment, which means that the language in 2B in the underlying Senate Economic Development uh, recommendation is going to move forward. So, um, and and I'll offer an explanation for why. So, Senator, you know, I think our concern was we said, can we can we aim for a performance metric of something like density, uh, a density metric for the town? Um, and uh, there, there actually is discussion of that kind of in this bill still and. Uh, more broadly in the community. So between the fact that that discussion is gonna be happening and uh, I think the biggest thing is there is a, an off ramp from any provision that hardwires in the eighth of an acre uh, provision that was frankly of concern to me, but uh, uh, and because of that off ramp and because it doesn't make a, um, which exists through 2023, um, there's ample time for people to evaluate whether or not this is the best solution, um, but it does assert that we should move towards greater density. Um, I think there'll be, I think there will be future legislative sessions, I imagine, are going to be talking about the same thing again. So given all that room and the off ramp, I receded from that part of our original amendment. So so, Mr. Chair, what what did we propose that was not uh, wholly embraced in a sentence or two? 
um, the sort of hardwired uh, provisions around inclusivity uh, in section 2B. Um, or another, my shorthand of saying it, this is too narrow. There's more, much more nuance to it, but it said, you know, thou shalt have a minimum lot size of one eighth of an acre. Um, and if you, if you're not going to do that, you can, you need to say why you're not going to do that. Um, because you can get out of that uh, quite easily by filing a report back to ACCD anytime in the next three years. Um, I said, okay, that provides a, a, an exit. It's acceptable. If that was, a, that was a deal breaker for economic development to not include that provision. In part because I think Senator Sorotkin said he has been working towards trying to get that kind of density requirement moved forward for years. And so to get this close and give up on it yet again was unacceptable, I'd say. So I said, okay, well, there's an out for towns that don't want to do it. I don't want to fall on my sword over that. We have plenty of other work in here. Thank you. Yep. The long two sentences. <laughs> um, so yeah, it picks it picks back up where where so you take that out and you drop right in where we were uh, managing the extinguishment of permits. So Ms. Chikowski, maybe you can resume the tour, unless there are any other committee questions. Okay, great, thank you. Great. So as I mentioned, um, that's the only change from yesterday was um, getting rid of the the strike. And so I do want to just flag a tiny issue um, that uh, because this has all happened so rapidly, the I need to adjust the effective date slightly for the reason you just mentioned about the three year window. Um, so I left it out of this uh, the draft 7.1. Um, so I need to just add that three year window back. So um, that's a small change that needs to be made. Um, but otherwise, yeah. You, okay. Does that get dropped in as another section or does it go just in effective dates? It's just going to go into the effective dates, right? Because 2B two, two yeah. doesn't go into effect for three years. Right. Okay. Right. Right. Thank you. So will we see, will that basically make it a, just so I make sure that at some point in the future, I'll be checking in on what people are looking at. Is there going to be a 7.2 version? Is that how this we, works? We can, we can call it that, yes, if you'd like. I, I'm happy to call it whatever you like. I just want to make sure I know what number I'm going to be looking for. It's, it's a small clerical error, so I will send it right as soon as, moments after we adjourn, I will send it. Okay. Just, seven, just to seven, clarify, seven. Senator Bray, sometimes yes. when we put things on the website, if it does have a slightly different number, it's more useful than it's if it's the same number. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So we can call it we can call it eight point one. Great. For, okay. Yeah. yeah. Make it Thanks. Obvious to people. Thank you. I liked it to be or not quite to be. <laughs> yes, we had fun with that last night in the meeting. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, as much fun as you can have negotiating uh, a bill in the nighttime. Okay, so and with that, that's it for changes, correct? Yep. Um, so uh, I will say that I the only other thing that it, that looks different is that the the numbers of instances are all different now. So um, yeah. So the first instance of amendment is this. Um, changing extinguishment to the release from jurisdiction. And so the second amendment has that new language. Right, the uh, district commission way of implementation. The district commission, yep. And then the third instance of amendment is the language um, striking out subdivision C7, which was the, um, the density requirements for neighborhood development areas. The four residences per acre versus specifying a quarter acre. Right. Correct. Um, the fourth instance of amendment has the wastewater permit language. 
And then the fifth instance of amendment has all the new Act 250 language um, from sections 24 to 45 has all the Act 250 language in it. Okay, just flipping pages. Man, I'm getting a, quite a library of copies of this bill <laughs> <still> now. <laughs> um. And so that's all that's changed. Great. So um, with that, then I think because it has that substantive change up front, we should, as a committee, review it and uh, take a committee position on the new amendment. If there's not any more discussion about it, then I would ask so, the clerk to um, make a motion to call the roll. The, um, Donald. Are the sponsors simply moving to substitute what is being proposed for the previous amendment? Is that the? Yes. Okay, which makes it's the cleanest way and you don't have to explain both of them because the one that's gone no longer is being amended. So, okay. Right. right, and actually the one that we reviewed yesterday because of that pending meeting with economic development, I had, had not sent that on to the Senate secretary yet. I didn't want to send on something that was okay. um, so after change. So this would be, we would actually only be referring to the calendar, this version that we're looking at right now, 8-1. So, uh, Mr. Chair, so uh, I'd like to make a motion to approve this new draft of the amendment to uh, S-237. And this is draft 8.1. 8.1. Thank you. Thank to you. To substitute for the one that we approved yesterday. So moved. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any discussion? Any further discussion? OK. Then I'd ask, please, the clerk to call the roll. Senator McDonald. Yes. Senator Rogers. Senator Parent. Uh, so I want to just ask a clarifying question. I'll support these changes, but I don't still support the overall amendment. How, so just vote yes here, and then but that won't mean I support. Oh, it's a substitute amendment. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So we're going to substitute hey. to all. Um, I'll say no for now. Okay. Uh, Senator Campion, yes. Senator Bray, yes. Yes. So that's uh, 311. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. So, uh, sorry, but. Um, yes, please. Senator McDonald. Um, Corey, I, I, Senator Parent was asking, I think, the appropriate question, which was to say he was perhaps willing to support this amendment as being better than the preceding one, but he did not intend to vote for for it to add it to the um okay. is that is that what yeah okay yeah so so I mean it, it's hard when it's a yes or no but so I, was, I think that would you would say that the vote was but like not the overall four right zero one or three one one which which would he prefer? I think three one one I guess is fine. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, that, well, we'll see. Uh, I was going to say that completes our work on that, but um, we're, we're not on the floor yet. We haven't made it all the way to third reading, so we'll see if anything more uh, crops up along the way. Um, but for now, I think we're settled, and I, I thank people for their uh, diligence and patience in hanging in there because it's never easy to get to the final version of things, especially this time of year. Um, with that, uh, so I wanted to, we'll put this aside. We're, we're going to have a caucus at noon. We'll be talking about the underlying bill 237 as well as, uh, I'll wait to see what the signal is from the pro tem, but I think he wants me to go ahead and talk about the amendment now, even if it's not going to be offered. Um, and I, my understanding is, I don't know, Senator Parent, if you're set on this or not, the pro tem was offering to delay, I think, 
yep. offering the amendment till Friday if the minority would be willing then to let us do all the work on Friday. Yeah, I, I can't speak to that piece, but um, I, I know about the delay. I, Joe has to answer if, if we'll be willing to let it all go Friday. I personally don't have a problem with it, but okay. I'll right. leave that to, I'll leave that to leadership. <laughs> I, I know the feeling, okay. I'll be, I feel like the catcher. I'm watching for signals uh, as well. Um, no, I should go the other way around. The pitcher is, uh, uh, gets the signals. Um, the, um, okay, enough baseball metaphors, which I'm not doing so well on. Uh, got it backwards. Let's switch over to our other major piece of work for the end of session, which is the Global Warming Solutions Act. Um, Mark is with us. Um, because I didn't know if we were in the process of doing this amendment, if we were going to be spending 15 minutes on it or 75 minutes, um, we have, I think for now, we'll have just a brief discussion about the balance of this week um, and work on GWSA. Um, as it turns out, uh, a lawyer who played a significant role in the development passage, et cetera, uh, and work on Global Warming Solutions Act in Massachusetts is now the Dean of the Law School uh, at VLS uh, or Dean of the, uh, might be the environmental program at the law school, at, uh, Jennifer Rushlow. She's going to be joining us tomorrow, so I figured this is a chance to hear from the inside someone who went through the entire process as well as took it all the way through the court case that helped um, lead to its eventual implementation of rules. Um, it'll be a helpful thing for us to hear because I think I would characterize some of our own questions as centering around how does this process work? Um, uh, regardless of what you're thinking of the goals, how, how does the process work? And are there any points at which we might want to look at making improvements? So for instance, Senator McDonald pointed out that if, um, if the chair of the um, clean uh, the energy planning group, the, uh, sorry, I'm not using the right name, uh, was, not inclined to meet, they might never call a meeting and that would pretty much stymie the work of the group. It would mean that roughly 18 months later, a &R would just go off and do rulemaking without that, uh, that climate plan. So uh, I think that's something we might consider addressing. Um, I have had conversations with people over the month or so since we started where some people said, uh, have you, is, uh, one of the largest emitters of greenhouse gases in the state is agriculture. Do you have anyone adequately representing agricultural interests um, on that panel? Uh, a similar question came up around manufacturing. Uh, we, we heard from Professor Cash, who said one of the strengths in Massachusetts was that manufacturers were part of crafting the solution. Um, so I thought we might wanna look at the membership from to what degree have we adequately brought manufacturing in? So uh, on my short list is, um, are, are those three things? Uh, another thing was kind of who legally owns the plan? Does a, a legislature need in some way, even though we don't have, you have an official way of saying this, does the legislature have a way of ratifying that doesn't, that is something other than writing a bill and going through the entire bill making process uh, to, sign off on the quote unquote plan. Um, so I think tomorrow I'd like to, I don't wanna put uh, uh, counsel on the spot since I didn't ask that question ahead of time, but I don't know if, if you can, um, Mr. Markland, look into, are there formulations that constitute something like ratification that would not be overly burdensome and time consuming, which is, a concern I think many people have. Uh, Senator McDonald. Uh, Mark, you're muted. The, one of the things is to put into the, into the bill that there shall be a ratification. The other way to do it is 
that the um, rules will not be promulgated or started until a, a specific amount of time after the um, right. the plan has been um, adopted, and that gives the legislature an opportunity to, you know, get in front of it and uh, or modify it or or revise statute. The shortcoming in that particular approach is the um, the tendency of administrations to ignore the date by which plans are supposed to be um, completed. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, so, Chair, right. so noted, uh, Senator Camp. So, what, what's our our plan? We have an hour and a half today uh, to sort of get through most, you know, a lot of this. But I'm not. I'm a little confused by what exactly we're doing today on the bill. Yep. So again, because I didn't know when oh. we were going to get Ellen, uh, Ms. Schakowsky, okay. back from economic development where she was right moments ago, how much change they were going to ask us to reconsider. Um, I see. Uh, and how long it might take for us to look at it and discuss. I didn't want to have. I didn't want to have a collision. Uh, sure. Yeah. So are we? So I'm sorry. So are, have we finished our work for the day, or is Mr. Martland here for something specific related to uh, Global Warming Solutions Act? Um, so we didn't. Ask, I did not ask him to prepare anything. Well, I'm okay. sure he's he's had so much work on this. He probably can answer uh, questions on the fly. But um, so the things I had wanted to do was just pause, say what's coming next. Okay. Uh, and ask some questions around this notion of ratification. Senator McDonald pointed out you could just have a, a rulemaking timeline that allowed for legislative intercession because of when the rules would arrive uh, by, by the time they'd be written compared to their effective date. So there's that possibility. Um, and I just wanted, in case we have requests of Mr. Marland, I don't know if people have ideas they would like to float out now so that he can be prepared for the balance of the week while he'll be joining us. Well, I, the only thing I would say is any questions that we have for tomorrow's witness, I suspect aside from a little bit of insight from Massachusetts, uh, I suspect Mr. Martland will be able to answer any legal questions. Right. I know he'll be able to. Right. Okay, so that's, that's the... Um, Mr. Martin, you want to say anything about the notion of what might constitute uh, a pathway to quote unquote ratification other than a bill? Is there any tool we have that we, well, we may not have it yet. Is there a possibility of creating such a thing? I was thinking about that later. Why, why do we have to stick to what we've always done? Is there a way to craft sort of a quote unquote ratification step? I think Senator McDonald has his, his, his hand up. I don't know if you... Mr. Chair, um, excellent question. Before we try and answer that one, is there, have you summarized the things that, um, our, our first option is to, is, to, is to agree with the House, uh, the other body. Are there, are there um, technical corrections that, that we have before us that are generally regarded as necessary on this bill or of the questions you've been asking here in the last few minutes, the, the what we should be focusing on. Um, I'd ask counsel for uh, to check me on this one. I'm not aware of any uh, required technical corrections that have emerged since the bill came over from the House, where someone sort of is catching an oops that we would need to address. There's one oops I caught. I think it was numbering. Um, so you could have an amendment to uh, correct that. It's it's not substantive, and we could even do it. And if you were going to concur with the House, we could do it in stat rev. But there's at least one oops that I'm aware of. OK, but we wouldn't have to have a new version. It could be concurrence with a um, change by sense. We treat it as a Scrivener's error or something like that. I, I believe so. You know, that's if, if you're going to do that, that's something I probably want to double check with the uh, Okay. Secretary, but I believe so. It's right. certainly not a substantive change. Okay, thank you. Um, so 
can you just pop me a note so I'll have that on my in basket of what that catch is, please? Or to the whole committee, actually. Certainly. And I think Senator Campion was asking about scheduling and I completely leave this up to the committee, but if you wish, we could discuss some of those issues or begin that discussion, or we could wait until tomorrow. Uh, no, if we, we are in hurry up land these days, so if, if we can have a bit of meaningful discussion around it, I just, because we hadn't had the chance to count on this, um, I didn't want to say, oh, well, you should just be able to respond on the fly. But if you're prepared to do that, great. Well, I appreciate that courtesy, and I will do my best to uh, begin to answer the questions. And then, of course, I would want to check my notes and maybe flesh that out tomorrow. Um, as background, first of all, very quickly, great that you're going to hear from the witness uh, tomorrow. That was basically a writ of mandamus, which is something we talked about in Massachusetts to require uh, Massachusetts executive branch to promulgate the rules to achieve the numerical greenhouse gas reductions. So we talked about that concept a little bit a couple weeks ago. I think she'll probably flesh that out tomorrow. As to the ratification of the plan or rules, let's separate them a little bit in the discussion. As to the ratification of the plan, um, I think that does raise some of the same concerns I discussed about uh, separation of powers and it, it may not be a crystal clear, it's a little bit of a gray area, but if you're asking a non-legislative entity, this uh, council, for example, to come up with this plan to then say that you're pulling it back and you need to approve it or ratify it, I think you perhaps could do that but it does raise some of those same concerns that you're handing it off to another branch or another entity, and then you're pulling it back and saying you have to approve it before it becomes complete or reality. So okay. it's just something to think about. And I ask a quick question on that sure. one. Um, so in what way would that be different than we create working groups, uh, you know, the, counts, the, the Commission on Act 250, although that had legislators on it, but we ask, we create working groups, we say, please report back. Um, and then we use the report as the basis for either legislating or rulemaking. In so, what way is this different? Very good question. A couple things. Number one, this council is not legislative. Okay. It doesn't have, at least doesn't have required legislators to be on it. Um, it doesn't necessarily preclude that. Um, there could be some experts in certain areas who, who might be legislators, but they're certainly not designated number of reps or senators. That's number one. Number two, you're not just asking for a report. You're asking for a report that then in statute is the basis for rulemaking. So it's, it's a little different process wise. Um, so it's something that you could consider doing. I just think it raises some of these concerns about handing this duty off and then pulling it back and saying uh, the report isn't final or valid until you approve it in some manner. Certainly having them do a report that they provide to you for review, not a problem at all, but saying that you somehow have to somehow have to approve it or rubber stamp it, that's a little different. And I think it raises some of those potential concerns. Yeah, I, I agree. I think pulling it back for a rubber stamp uh, doesn't, doesn't make sense. Now, the other issue was the legislature's rule. So the comments I just made focus on the plan and you um, approving the plan or, or something like that. The other issue was the rulemaking and whether the legislature could have a role in approving the rules before they're final, separate from LCAR. And I had mentioned to you that you could not withstand the current Administrative Procedure Act in Vermont or somehow add another layer but that that even more so raised those separation of powers concerns to me. And I also talked to you about how I wasn't certain the mechanism or vehicle to do that, that a resolution uh, does not have the force of law, does not bind parties. Uh, so merely passing a resolution, I, I didn't see how that really achieved that objective or had any force of law. Um, and if you, of course, 
were passing a bill to approve rules, why not just pass a bill? And so I wasn't quite certain how that is different than simply passing a bill. Plus, once again, it has those same concerns in my mind about the separation of powers and giving the executive branch, in this case, it would be a &R, that authority, but then pulling it back and saying that you have to uh, approve the exercise of that authority. Now, so these are things to flesh out. Sure. Um, they're concerns. I don't think it's crystal clear. I think this is a little bit of a gray area in the law, but I do have those concerns or issues. There's one other issue I wanted to raise that I think I mentioned, but I just want to make sure you folks are aware of it, is that even if you concurred with this bill, so even if you agreed with what the House had done and you gave this rulemaking authority to a &R, there are certain things that they can't do that only the General Assembly can do imposing a new fee, appropriating funds, and any effort to address climate change may involve additional funding. Uh, passing a tax, for example, if you're seeking to impose a fee or pass a tax that would guide consumer behavior, only the General Assembly can do that. And of course, under current law, uh, there's many areas where what you're currently doing is dictated by statute. So any changes to those areas would also require statutory change. For example, earlier in the session, you looked at a bill that would increase the requirements pursuant to the renewable energy standard. You can't change those requirements via rule because they're set in statute. So if you wanted to go to 100% of your tier one, you'd have to pass a law to do that. If you wanted to increase uh, distributed generation under tier two, you'd have to do that via law. So for various reasons, there's areas that the General Assembly would still have to be involved. And our position in Ledge Council is that includes joining TCI. And that's something that the, the executive branch may not fully agree with, but that's our position as your attorneys that the General Assembly uh, has to give approval before the state can join TCI. Uh, sorry, the Transportation and Climate Initiative, which would establish a uh, cap and invest system for transportation related fuels. Okay. Um you brought up TCI, so let me ask two questions. Start with that one. It, uh, as counsel for the General Assembly, um, have is there any pro activity underway on TCI? I mean, COVID has uh, changed a lot of things. I don't know if it's affected the rollout of that, but or, you know, back in January or so, we heard that we thought there might be a rule and a sign-on period that would happen something like uh, April May. Uh, That's been delayed. So you are correct. Because of COVID, they delayed it, I believe, until the fall. Okay. So they've uh, moved back their deadlines for the final rule and the uh, window for states to decide whether they're joining the initiative or not. I believe that's into the fall at this point. Okay. Thank you. Um, and on the legislative approval of rules. So, yeah, from serving with Senator McDonald on LCAR, I would... That would seem like a, a, a bad idea to me. A rule, we would ask for a rule and then ask to have it approved. To, we already have the APA to take care of it. However, to Senator McDonald's point, if, if the timeline for the development of that rule spanned a legislative session, um, it would provide uh, an opportunity for us to act if we saw something that seemed problematic. And I don't know if we have any kind of I don't know that I remember a rule that said, for instance, if you don't show up on time, like you bring your rule in in June, and, which is generally right after we've left, if that we would ever provide a provision that would say, then that rule, is there any way to say that you can't um, wait for us to go home basically and then bring the rule forward? Well, I think, you, I think that's a, a valid idea, which is modify the time periods to make sure that there's a sufficient window for the General Assembly to take action if you choose. So you could definitely do that. And right now, the time periods are really, really condensed and optimistic. So you could stretch them out a little bit to uh, make sure that you folks are in session and you have time to review the proposed rule and then have sufficient opportunity to take action if you choose to. I, I think you could definitely do that. Um, 
you have a timeline document, don't you? I think so. I've seen that. Somewhere. Yes, I do. I, I'm not sure if I provided this committee, right. but I certainly can. It was one of the slides, in fact. I'm sorry, I do have it. Okay. And I can um, email you what, uh, what PowerPoint to look at. I don't think I can take out that slide, but okay. yes, you could modify the time periods. Uh, right now, the time period is what? Is anything, uh, is there a time period for when the rule comes back? Yes, let me, if you give me a second, let me pull up my file and look at it. There are time periods right now set in the bill, but they're, as I mentioned to you, they're, they're quite tight. They're quite optimistic. Um, Sir McDonald, you've been around this block on rule making and timelines many times. What's your advice to the committee? Well, there, there are two examples that I, that I have mentioned before, and I will mention them again today because we're, we're thinking, um, I will mention them again today. One was the how we got rid of the 10 acre um, loophole for for septic, we directed the the um, administration to come up with alternative septic rules so that um, that had to be in place regardless of the size of the plot. And we demanded that that in the statute we legislated that the proposed rules be available to the legislature on the fifteenth of January, um, but that they not be submitted. Um, put forth, promulgated until sometime in uh, June after the legislature's business was completed. And the, the rules were done on time. The legislature went through, uh, the committee had hearings on them. There were arguments made and the legislature um, did not interfere with change or diminish the proposed rules in any substantive fashion. And when the legislature adjourned, the rules were put forth uh, as called for, and they took place. Um, we mimicked that, ex that experience in our um, rules about renewable energy and, um, and um, net metering and directed the administration to come back in January and present um, proposed rules for changes in net metering. And the administration did not do that. The legislation that we had in place said they should come back on the 1st of January and they should not promulgate rules until after the legislature had had an opportunity to review those, the, those, um, the rules that were being outlined and proposed. And we gave the administration the authority um, after the legislature had done its review or made some changes, we gave them the authority to implement the rules by order so as to um, have them done in a timely fashion. And what happened was the administration failed to present the rules, um, didn't present them on time, didn't present them at any time during the legislative session. And then after we went home, they implemented new rules that had not been presented to the legislature in the statute. And they did it by order. And they said the statute gave them the authority. Elkar objected and said that this was not legal. They had exceeded their authority. And our counsel and those of us in Elkar believed that the objection was, uh, was appropriate. And we, we objected. At that point, um, um, it was a couple months before the next legislature met. And when the next legislature met, um, the utilities all came running in and said, we've changed our computers, we've done this, we've changed our billing cycle, the paperwork has already been printed. And if you, if this order is overturned, it will cause us uh, great problems and hassles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the legislature um, through, um, either wisdom, uh, principle, or cowardice, um, my editorial comment, cave and um, allowed the rules to go into place that had not gone through the, you know, the public hearing process that had not been presented to the legislature as called for. And um, that's what happened. And um, 
so the, the one is an example of the legislature doing something in good faith and the other perhaps was the administration um, didn't get their proposals done on time to the legislature but they used you know we we in the legislature made a mistake and gave them an opportunity to do it by order um, if after we'd reviewed it and they did it by order without us having had the chance to review it so those are the pitfalls in the and examples of how the system system has worked and how um, it failed to work. Okay. So our solutions were probably that's that was a long explanation of the, the right. tribulations. Yeah. Um, I'm fine with concurring with the House bill and then being um, you know like hounds behind the administration and if they don't move forward and say that and you know complain and whine and 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 you know, nip at their heels um that's one way thing we could do or the other is to um follow the example that worked and not give them the authority to initiate new rules by order if they haven't completed the um if the committee has not provided its advisory um opinion on what the rules ought to be that's those are our choices I can show the deadlines, the time periods, if you wish, Mr. Sure. Chair. I had that slide up. Okay. And can you, um, thanks for pulling that slide and we'll look at that. Do you have any comments on Senator McDonald's narratives there? Like, it, it, it sounds like there's no question on legality, like separation of powers, that the fact that the legislature built in a, created a schedule designed to let it have a look before rules move forward. Does that sound correct? There's no problem with constructing a timeline to ensure that you have an adequate opportunity to look at the proposed rules and take any action or give input as you deem appropriate. I do not think you can build in a requirement that a committee or the General Assembly right. vote to approve those rules. Right. I do not think you can do that, but you can build the timelines to give yourself an opportunity to weigh in Thank you. Review as you think appropriate. Okay. Of course, they Thank don't need to follow your suggestions. That's the other part of that. <laughs> as Senator McDonald's story shows, we're batting 500, I suppose, using that approach. Okay. Um, All star material. Host, please. <laughs> right. If it's baseball, 500 would be pretty good. Yeah. The legislator, I'm not so sure I'd only want to bat 500. But. Jude, could you make me co-host so I could share my screen, please? If you want, I could just verbally read you those. No, it's timers. coming. It just oh, takes great, a thanks. minute. Yeah. Great, thank you. I've got it, thank you very much. And I'll just uh, expand this. So can everyone see that okay? So yeah. it's effective on passage. The Climate Council is appointed the council adopts the plan on or before December 1st, 2021. And our develops rules from roughly the time of adoption. Hopefully they'll have some advance notice of what's in the plan until May. That the rules have to be uh, submitted to the council at least 45 days before the filed with ICAR, which begins a formal rulemaking process. So that'd be early to mid May of 2022. They have to be presented to various committees, including your committee, at least 30 days before they're filed with ICAR. So that'd be late May to very beginning of June, 2022. They then have to be filed with ICAR by July 1st. That process proceeds. And once again, that process is a very tight deadline under these current uh, time periods. It's very optimistic. And they're supposed to be adopted, the final rules by December 1st, 2022, 
and those rules would be targeted to meet the 2025 reduction, uh, greenhouse gas reduction targets. Any questions uh, about that? Mayor McDonald. Well, the, the notion that the rules to be written based on the plan that was put forth, that they would be written in so that the legislature could look at them in May is, um, is totally unworkable. That just, you, you can't even, you, know, you that's just unworkable. They, the rules have to be available in when the legislature meets in a given session. Um, so it, as I, some folks, some senators and witnesses have said it's a pretty ambitious timeline, but, and I have to agree, that's a pretty ambitious timeline. Right. Um, Mr. Martland, when you say ambitious, um, is that because it is built on the statutory minimum time for each step in the overall process? Yes, it, it's, yeah. I've said optimistic, uh, very tight. Uh, yes, it it's gives the, what we calculated is, is really the minimum time period under the various statutes. Obviously these rules, or at least I assume these rules would be complex and there'd be lots of public input and it doesn't really expand the time period to take account of that. So it is assuming that they can really keep to the statutory minimum time periods and they're able to uh, receive public input and do whatever they need to do in a very, very tight period of time. Right. Um, Mr. Well, Chair, who, yeah. was, who, who was the witness who, um, whose testimony focused on the following point that just because if you were to pass such a bill, um, it is unrealistic um, to expect the legislature not to begin to um, pass some interim steps um, well before the rules are written, to pass steps in statute to begin implementing, implementing some of the um, foundations of any rules. Uh, I think Senator, uh, Rep. Mr. Martland um, mentioned I, things like- I don't recall uh, a witness in particular saying that, earlier. but I know that, yeah. I'm not so recalling it, any particular witness saying that, but I know uh -huh. that that's been in our committee discussion. For instance, um, I know members of this, I don't know if, my thing is saying my connection is unstable. Can people still hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, the, uh, we as a committee, for instance, have had two years of work so far on phasing into an all fuels energy efficiency program, which if it were implemented, I would, uh, as we all understand it so far, would have a major impact on greenhouse gas emissions. So I would never expect us or any other committee to tap the brakes and say, we need to wait for a, a rulemaking and a plan from another body to before we should go ahead with our own best work. So uh, in fact, I think in, in Massachusetts before rulemaking it was ever invoked because it was delayed and then it had to go to court in order to force the hand of their Department of Environmental Conservation or its counterpart to write rules. They'd already achieved 60% of their greenhouse gas reductions prior to the rules being written. So I think we're counting on more than leaning just on GWSA to uh, make progress. The other thing is this program as outlined in the bill has a, a lengthy phase in. And um, personally, I would like to see us take much more assertive action that we know quite well what we can do far sooner. So I don't know if it's a witness or just your chair, but, <laughs> or maybe. I, maybe, I yeah. thought, okay, I'm, I'm very, I'm, I was pouring through some notes here and I just didn't yeah. get, find it. Um, Mr. Chair, the, um, I will, I've gone a week without mentioning 1336, 
which is the number of days between Pearl Harbor and the and Japan suing for peace. Um, and this this bill doesn't you know is um, doesn't recognize that there were many activities that were initiated uh, almost immediately, such as within two months, the United States of America quit manufacturing automobiles in order to take on the challenge of World War II. And that was just um, less than two months, we ended the manufacture of automobiles. This bill talks for a couple of years and, um, and plans and um, argues before anything concrete happens. So, just, you're uh, suggesting we might move up the the, the timeline, push it I, a I, little bit, or because I, I think your point, you know, your point's a good one. In anticipation, of once you get the plan, um, if yeah. the legislature does not uh, on the timeline in the bill, when the legislature gets the plan in January of 2021. You know, damn well needs to pass some laws to begin to implement the the basic tenets of the plan, not the, to whether it's fees or income or something. It's going to have to pass something in order to have um, any chance that rules will the rules will be meaningful in uh, in any you know time period. So we're going to that would we the legislature would be faced with that dilemma whether we gave the legislature time to review the, the rules or whether we simply concurred with the bill. If we don't act during that, that session, then another year is lost. Right. Well, based on the timeline and my experience around rulemaking, maybe yours, I always think of it as taking a year, which would mean instead of having rules coming out in the summer of 21, they would be more like coming back in the, you know, maybe January of 22, at which point then there would be a legislative session just starting and you'd have an opportunity to work. But I think, you know, what you're pointing out to me is the other possibility is not only having that, the rules coming along as helpful, but that the plan that's been passed to ANR that's going to quote unquote drive rulemaking would also be a useful document to the legislature in and of itself. And we need not wait for rules. we we'll just take it and run. Maybe that's what you're saying. Take the plan. Yeah, uh, if, if, the if the legislature, last session, we considered a, a bill from the House to raise some money uh, with a tax on, uh, on heating oils. Um, heating fuels, motor fuels, and it was a tepid, narrow tax that didn't do much. And we were hogtied on whether or not to pass it or to make it a, uh, to raise some monies that actually provided money to actually do something. And we, we rejected the proposal from the other body. And we earmarked some of our electric efficiency money in the interim to train um, a host of people to be ready to insulate and work on, uh, on thermal heating. That's what we dedicated some money to so that this legislative session, the one that we're in now, would have come up with the way to begin to put those people to work actually um, making progress and reducing um, the, the heat loss in this state and putting money into Vermonters' pockets, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we haven't done that. We simply haven't done that. We've been diverted on other things. Right. So that's the, we in the legislature have many, many excuses not to tackle what needs to be done and might, Final editorial comment would be as we struggle now with the COVID response. Um, this is another example of um, we were told what we was coming, and um, 
we didn't do much in, until April. Um, and right now we're debating whether we've done too much or what we ought to do next. So that's, uh, that's our nature. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would, one reminder for us, I think is on what we did last year on, I regret along with you that we did not um, uh, increase that excise tax and move to help create a more robust uh, program. You said hogtied, I'd say beat about the head and shoulders, whatever it was, we didn't move forward on it. And the program uh, I'd say has been limited ever since by um, it's relatively low level of funding. Um, we did do in 337 this year, there is that $2 million that helps get us ready for next year, which I hope is maybe a, a far more robust program. So yeah, 2 million here and there, it's not a, uh, an adequate response. Um, that slow timeline, which has us working through the PUC for the all fuels, uh, energy efficiency utility is uh, a direct result of the legislature, I would say, needing to have independent expert outside analysis to help buck us up to do what much analysis has already showed would be, I think, a good idea environmentally and economically. But uh, that's, that's the painful nature of a legislative body sometimes, slower than we would like. And, you know, on one quick note, I'll editorialize on COVID. Uh, I'd say one bright note to me is that when we see something worth doing, we actually have been able to respond surprisingly quickly. And then when people say we can't afford things, the fact that we can mobilize more money than I've ever seen laying in Vermont, I mean, it's coming, it's our money directed from the feds. But um, we're getting a little off topic. I'm just afraid that. Yeah. But I agree with the concept that, you know, that, that, yes, if the feds wanted to give us those, those dollars to deal with climate would be, would be great. Right. So I'll, I'll go back on to topic anyway. Um, so with that, it's 11. I don't know if there's any more comments. We, any more discussions that it's helpful to see the timeline. I'm really looking forward to tomorrow. I think the witness uh, sounds great. Um, and I appreciate you reaching out to her. I think uh, it'd be good to, to hear some on the ground experiences. Um, the, uh, our witness tomorrow is also the author with another partner on an article that uh, examines this whole history and issues that came up. Uh, it's called, the article's name is Behind the Curtain Insider's View of Developing and Enforcing State Climate Change Laws by Sue Reed and Jennifer Rushlow. Uh, it appears in Environmental Law Reporter. I have a copy of the article and I'll send it to Jude and ask Jude to distribute it to the committee. If you have the time and interest, I think of, uh, I'm planning actually I'm reading it tonight. I haven't read it yet, but um, it would be an interesting back, bit of background reading before tomorrow's testimony. Um, and if you have questions um, that you think may take some research or thinking before her appearance, um, please send them to me by the end of the day. And I'm going to send her a couple of questions. I'll try to get as much as I can to her so that she knows the kind of things we're, we're apt to ask questions about before coming in tomorrow. All right. So if there's nothing more, thank you for um, jumping in, Mr. Martland, to help us get uh, a running start back into the world of Global Warming Solutions Act. Um, and committee, just so that people have a sense of pace, um, if we have relatively minor adjustments, um, then I would uh, think in order to keep pace with the current Senate calendar, we should be aiming to uh, vote a bill out by the end of this week. Uh, at the very latest beginning of next, but- um, Or the I earliest tomorrow. Yeah. Perhaps as soon as the big, uh, yeah. So we're in time- Friday, Friday works for me. Okay. 
next week. Yeah. Corey, are you in on Friday? Yep, I'll be here Friday. I won't be here tomorrow. Okay. All right. So um, hope all goes well with your family event. And yeah. if there's nothing more, any committee members have anything else you'd like to add? All right. If there's nothing else, then we are adjourned for today. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you.